this is Duke University. Hello from sunny Durham. Actually, not so sunny, but hello anyway. Uh, the first thing I want to tell you is that I learned a really important lesson uh, this morning, which is it's not a great idea to take a red eye and then commit to something like a discussion on camera with people. But I'm going to, I had some coffee, so I'm, I'm ready for it, but I've also learned my lesson. So welcome to the faculty conversations. Uh, my name is Dan Ariely. I'm one of the faculty here at Duke. And today we're going to try and talk a little bit about the psychology of money. Uh, we had a short video presentation that talked mostly about the pain of paying, and I'm going to talk about that. I had some questions that people send in advance. I'll try to address those. And if you have any questions now, feel free to uh, tweet them. And our hashtag is uh, Fuku Alumni. Yeah? Very good. OK, so let's, let's start. So if you remember from the video, the pain of paying is all about the idea that when you couple, payment at the same time of consumption, this makes the consumption less pleasurable. You see the money draining away. And we gave lots of examples for this. I want to give you one more, which I, sadly I couldn't do for real. So one of the problems we have in uh, our hospital, but in uh, many hospitals, is that people uh, stay for a long time and sometimes they should get released earlier, but people don't want to get released. Hospitals are uh, comfortable, people get sick, they don't know how they will function in their home environment, uh, doctors don't know it as well. So one of the proposals we had was to take one of the channels on the TV station and show people the running bill. Imagine much like a gas station when you show people the running bill, you would show them the bill. After every meal, after every aspirin, you would show something uh, that is running. Now, the doctors thought I was evil even by proposing it. And I, of course, think it's evil not to do it because the reality is that often we leave patients with those bills. It's either them or their families that have to, to pay for it. So letting them know, of course, is actually important. But I agree with them that letting people know in real time will probably change dramatically the dynamic in hospitals. Maybe patients would actually demand better treatment and more attention if they saw exactly how much they're paying for, for everything. Anyway, so this is an experiment that I don't think would work out, but just, just think about it. I had a couple of questions about uh, home energy. And the particular question, one of the, the questions were, why don't people do the right thing in terms of home energy? And I think there's kind of two directions there. One is that there are some things that people should rationally not do. Uh, when I went to insulate the attic in my house, the contractor that came in basically showed me on paper what a stupid decision this was. He showed me how much it would cost me. He said it would not increase the value of the home. And it would save me only about 5% or 10% of my energy bill, which would never pay for the cost of insulation. So the reality is that because electricity is so cheap, uh, there are many things about home energy use that are actually not rational to do. They're not, uh, it's not good not to do them for long-term sustainability of the planet. But it's not a rational thing to do from a selfish cost-benefit analysis. Um, there was a, a beautiful study done in the UK. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> um, however, there's another category of things. For example, light bulbs. If you replace light bulbs, uh, it varies how quickly it changes, the, how, how quickly it can pay for itself. But if it's a light bulb that you use a lot, in three months it can pay for itself. And under those conditions, you would say, why don't people do it? Why? Even if it's not about never paying, it's not about paying in a year, it's paying rather quickly. Why don't people do it in this case? And I think there are two reasons. One is that three months is a long time away, and it's not soon enough. And the second is that if you look at how we buy light bulbs, there's actually quite a lot of friction. And what I mean by friction is not uh, you know, physical friction, but what I mean is difficulty in making the decision. So when you go to a hardware store to buy a bulb, you probably have the bulb from home, so you remember what you want. And then you go and you look on the shelf what fits it. But if you want to get something that is high energy, high efficiency, all of a sudden you need to go to a different shelf or a, a next uh, section. And the numbering is very different. And it's not really clear to you what, what you're getting. And because of that, the decision is slightly more difficult. And one of the things we know from 
social science in general is that every time you make decisions even slightly more complex, you change dramatically what people decide. So imagine that you thought about it from this perspective, perspective of friction. What would you do differently? For example, would you show the light bulb that you have in your hand and next to it, not a shelf over, but next to it you would show the substitute with the high energy efficiency one? I think the answer is absolutely yes. There's one more study I want to point out. This is a beautiful study that was done in the UK. The British government has an office uh, for behavioral economics and they basically do all kinds of interventions with the British citizens. Uh, my theory for why they do it is first of all they are innovative but they're also so broke that they have to really resort to anything to try and improve uh, their economic situation. So here is what they did. They ap ap applied to people, appealed to people and they said why don't you increase the insulation in your attic? And in fact, they offered people a financial incentive for doing that. But they got very, very low uptake. So instead, they changed the framing. They wrote people and they say, hey, here's the offer we have for you. We will come to your attic. We will take everything from your attic and we will put it downstairs. And as we put it downstairs, you could try and figure out which things you want to store and which things you don't store. While you're sorting things out, we will go to the attic and insulate it. And when the time you finish, we'll take the things you want to put back in the attic, we'll put it back. The things you want to throw away or give away, we'll help you do that. Now, this is the same process. It's basically insulating your attic. But now they did not phrase it as something that you would do now for a long-term benefit. They phrased it as something that you would do now to basically sort out the attic. And what happens? With less financial discounts, the program was much more appealing. So again, small frictions in how we phrase things is very important. And when we do things for the long term, our interest is much lower in, in, in these programs compared to something that is about the short term interest. Another question that came up was a question about uh, subscription, electronic subscription, and a question about app stores. Now, here is the amazing thing about the app store. Uh, on the app store, there are many applications you could get for free and you could get for 99 cents. And it's amazing how people view the paying 99 cents as something offensive. You know, these are the same people that later on go to Starbucks and buy coffee for 2.99 and they don't think about this extra dollar. But when it's phrased between something free and something that costs a dollar, that gap looks incredibly large. Right? And all of a sudden people don't pay for it. Now I think actually this was a mistake uh, by Apple and also by by Android, because by allowing a free version, they make the 99 cent version look incredibly abusive. That how can somebody charge that much when we actually deserve uh, the free one? And the problem, of course, that if people gravitate only to free apps, this does not create a very good um, ecosystem for people to develop apps. If you think that the development of an app would cost you $50,000 and there's only a few thousand people that want that, and most of them will never pay a dollar for it, what are the chances you'll go ahead and develop it? So by creating this gap and this pain of paying, all of a sudden people basically refuse to pay. Now in this particular case, it's not just the pain of paying, it's the pain of paying compared to free, which is particularly salient and particularly uh, difficult. It's about no paying to paying something that's a very difficult uh, step to take. People don't take it, they get the free apps, uh, don't get as much value and don't give the enough value to the ecosystem of app app developers. There were a couple of questions about the social nature of money. And one question was about how do you share uh, the bills at the end of a meal? Imagine you go to dinner with three other friends and at the end of the then the bills come, and now the question is how to, how to divide it. Uh, some people say, well, everybody should pay exactly what they paid for. Well, if you think about this process, it's kind of a minutia-like process, right? You basically, you look at the bill and you say, well, you had this and you had this, and let's do all the math and figure out what everybody owes. And on top of that, you know, if you took a bite from me or something else happened, you know, we shared the meal, we shared something, what, what do we do with that? That, I think, is a terrible way to end a meal, right? You have a meal that is all about friendship and spending time together, and all of a sudden you get into this uh, financial exchange in which you're trying to 
do better than the other person or uh, give them, uh, figure out who is paying for what and what percentage of tip and so on. Another approach, of course, is to equally share things. And that's a reasonable approach. It doesn't have this mathematical calculation at the end of the meal where you have to figure out what you're spending and so on. Um, but, but let's think of it from the psychology of the pain of paying. What do we know about the psychology of the pain of paying? We know that when you don't pay, there's zero pain of paying. And then the pain of paying increases, but it doesn't increase in, in the same speed as the amount of money. So when you uh, pay from zero to 10, your pain of paying increased dramatically. When it's between 10 and 20, it's not the same amount. So it has kind of a diminishing returns. If you pay 1,000 versus 1,100, not that big. So if we think about that, it means that paying nothing compared to something is a big deal, but paying a lot compared to even more is not such a big deal. So because of that, I think that what people should do is they should switch who is paying for the meal, right? So it's, imagine it's me and three other friends, every time one other person is paying. And what would happen in those conditions? The three other people would have no pain of paying. They would have zero pain of paying. And I would have a pain of paying. I would have a pain of paying that is not four times larger than what I would pay if I just paid my share, because again, pain of paying has diminishing return. And the other three people would have zero pain of paying. So instead of four people each having some pain of paying, I would have all of it. Everybody else would uh, have none of it. On top of that, if I treat people, I can feel extra specially wonderful about that. I've treated my friends, and then another time they treat me and I get a free meal, I think it's a better system. Now, of course, you don't always eat with the same friends, and this always doesn't always work out perfectly from a, a financial calculation. But I think that the gain in happiness and utility is actually worth it. So try it for a while. Let me know what you think about this, this approach. Another uh, question uh, I was asked is the question about happiness and giving money away. And there's, a, there's an old result in economics which shows that the relationship between happiness and money is not as you suspect. So uh, getting more money is better, but up to a certain level. And from that level, the increase in happiness is not as high still. First of all, it's good to have money than to live in a cardboard box. There's no question about that. But at a certain level of income, money doesn't have the returns we expect it to have. And uh, Bo Derek, the actress, I think she's the one who said that if you think that money can't buy happiness, you just don't know where to go shopping. And of course, she's right in some way, because there are many things we don't know how to do in terms of where to go shopping. So for example, often, we buy fixed things. We buy bigger homes, and we buy bigger cars, and newer cars. And we get used to those things, and we don't get as much happiness from them. So you say to yourself, oh, I'll get a new car. I'll be really happy. And you are really happy. But you're happy for a shorter time, and then the happiness decreases over time. So you think to yourself, you'll get happy for a long time. You get the shorter time happiness. So people buy too much physical stuff, and we don't buy enough experiences. Because when you get an experience, often, particularly interesting experiences, they can often change your perception of yourself, change you to some degree. If you go scuba diving, skydiving, climb some mountain, and so on, all of a sudden you can consume that experience, not just while it's happening, you can consume it for a long time after the event uh, is over and actually keep on enjoying the gift that keeps on giving. But in addition to this idea that people don't know how to, uh, what to buy, uh, Mike Norton and Elizabeth Dunn have been doing all kinds of interesting research to show that we actually become happier when we give money away. And this is a really interesting idea, and they've shown it in all kinds of ways with all kinds of other colleagues. I'll just tell you about a couple of studies. Imagine I gave you a Starbucks gift card, and I say, go and buy yourself coffee. How happy would you get as a consequence of that, and how long will this happiness last? Now imagine that I gave you the same card, and instead of saying, go ahead and buy yourself a cup of coffee, I say, go ahead and give a stranger a cup of coffee. What will happen now? Now your happiness actually is as high in terms of the gift, but it stays longer. Why? Because you became a hero in somebody's eyes. You keep on remembering, thinking about it, 
and therefore your happiness is higher. And it's even higher if you give the coffee to somebody you know, because now your bond has increased, reciprocity has increased, they care more about you, and all of a sudden your social currency has increased as well. Now, one of the nicest experiments they did was to repeat this experiment, this basic experiment, with a group of drug reps in Europe, in Belgium. And they took one group of drug reps and they gave each of them 15 euros to spend on themselves. And they watched how hard they worked as a consequence of that. And you know, people felt some reciprocity toward, toward the workplace. The workplace, after all, gave them 15 euros. They worked slightly harder. The workplace recovered about half of these 15 euros. So in net, it was a loss. They put 15 euros in, they got about half back. To another group, they gave them 15 euros to spend on other people in their team. Now, they did not give them cash, but they basically bought them gifts. What happened now? Now the return to the company was more than 70 euros. Why? Because the social fabric of these individuals increased. All of a sudden, they cared more about other people in the team. All of a sudden, they showed up to meetings on time, they talked to each other, they gave each other tips, and so on. So, there are two things about giving money away that I think is, are actually quite interesting. The first one is that consuming a bit more doesn't change our happiness as much as we think. The second is that giving money away has extra benefit. And in particular, giving money away to somebody we know and have a social contract with can actually increase things even further because all of a sudden our attachment to them can increase, reciprocity can increase, and so on. There's another line of research on the psychology of money that kind of bears on this question of gift versus money, and this is the question of monetary norm versus social norm. And I want you to think about the following thought experiment. Imagine that I asked you for a favor. Imagine I said, would you help me change a tire on my car? And imagine you were close by and you could do it. Ask yourself, how likely would you be to help me change a tire on my car? But imagine that I said something else. I said, would you help me change a tire on my car? I'll give you $3 for it. What would happen now? Would you say, gee, I get to help Dan plus I get $3? Probably not. You would probably say, oh, this is work. I don't work for $3. Give me 200 we can talk about it. But for 3 not that interested. So what's happening here is that when we pay people nothing, they're willing to work. When we increase the payment to a small amount, willingness to pay goes down. And when we pay a lot, of course, we can get people to work hard again, right, for thousands of dollars and so on. But at the low end of the scale, you add money to the equation, and people actually decrease their, their motivation. And if you think about it, we do it in all kinds of cases. I think the No Child Left Behind policy is one example. We take teachers, and we put a small amount of money if they get their, our kids to perform better on a particular exam. Uh, are we getting them to work harder? It's not a big enough bonus for them to care, and at the same time, it basically cheapens their understanding of themselves. All of a sudden, they say, well, you know, I'm, not, I'm not here to work for $2,000. That's not why I chose this profession. I have a mission. I have an ideology. I care about kids. I care about education. It's not about these small amounts of money. The moment you give that small amount of money, you reframe the discussion around that, and all of a sudden, you decrease people's motivation. So we did lots of experiments on this. Uh, we asked people to do all kinds of stuff, to drag circles on the screen, to help us move sofas, all kinds of stuff. And we found this pattern. People work for nothing. They don't work for small amounts of money. They work harder for big amount of money. And then we asked the question of, how do we solve this problem in the world? I mean, we do deal with lots of small amounts of money. How do we solve it in kind of our natural environment? And we thought about gifts. If you think about gifts, gifts are very interesting. Uh, they're clearly financially inefficient. Imagine I invited you to come to my house for dinner, and you wanted to bring a bottle of wine. Um, and let's say you were going to spend $40 on it. Right? You don't know what wine I like. Red, white, what variety, from which continent, what type, and so on. So maybe you would spend $40, but I could find one that I like as much or even more for $20. What a waste of money. So you might come to me and say, Dan, thank you very much for inviting me for dinner, but not knowing which wine you like exactly, here is $40, buy yourself the best wine you can do, buy 
with $40. So maybe you'd give me $30. This way you would save some money and I would get extra benefit. But of course, that will be financially efficient, but it will not be socially efficient. In no way will it increase our social relationship, our connection, how we view each other. In no way, if you ask me for a favor tomorrow or next week, will giving me cash for coming for dinner is going to uh, make me want to uh, help you out in any, in any way. So what do people do? We obfuscate the financial exchange. We give something that is worth money, but we call it a bottle of wine. And by hiding the amount of money, we make the exchange look much more, much more social. So <clears throat> this, this, I think, is an important idea. And if you think about it, there's all kinds of other mediums. There's giving people gift cards, like uh, American Express or Visa or MasterCard gift card. Financially efficient, does it increase friendship? There's uh, registries for uh, weddings and birthdays and so on. Again, financially more efficient, but I don't think it has any kind of financial value. If I had the registry, which I don't, for something, and you contributed money to it, I think the, the way I would think about you differently after this gift is not very high. So it wouldn't do much for the uh, social uh, utility. So, so the idea is we live in this uh, world in which we have social norms on one hand and financial norms in another. And the world of social norms, the best example is marriage, right? You don't have direct contract. You don't say, honey, you take the, dish, you take the garbage. I'll pay you $3. I do this. You pay me and so on. And then we have work per hour or work per unit, which is extreme. But most things in life, and particularly the workplace, is somewhere in the middle. And I think there's some wisdom in that, right? We don't want to pay people for the, for the word. We don't want to pay for a particular unit of production. Because we want people to have the social caring. We want people to think about our overall benefit. If, if something else needs to be done, we want them to care about this. If there's some fluctuation, we want people to, to handle that. We don't want people to just think about themselves as working for money. We want them to think about themselves as working in a larger, larger social good. Um, there is an interesting uh, case here, though which is this transition between market norms and social norms is actually quite tricky. So a couple of my friends did this, the following study. Uh, they went to a daycare center, and they found out that the parents were late from time to time. So what did they say? They asked the, pa they asked the, the kindergarten to put fines. So if you were a parent and you came late, you got a, a $4 fine uh, for being late. For every hour you got, a, I think it was 4 or $5 uh, fine. What happened with this fine? What do you think happened? Parents were more late. Why? Because it's 3 o'clock, and you, you have something important to do at work, and they're fining you for $5 an hour. What do you say? You say, well, you can keep my kid for three more hours. I have other things to do right now. Before the fine was introduced, the teacher would look at her watch. She would look at the parents. She would make them feel guilty. When the fine was introduced, guilt went away. Right? In the same way that we said that once you introduce small financial amounts, the social utility goes away. Your joy from helping me change the tire on my car goes away the moment we introduce money to it. The same thing, the guilt that parents felt about the social contract of coming on time goes away. All of a sudden they say, it's just payment. I just have to figure out how much I want to pay. What is this worth? So they kept on running this for a while until they figured out this was a bad idea. And then they took it away. And what do you think happened when they took it away? Right? You could say, well, things would go right back. We were in a social norm. We, we were in a, in a social norm. We moved to a money norm. You cancel the money, we would move right back to the social norm. The answer is no. Until the next year, nothing really changed. Why? Because once you took guilt away out of the exchange, taking money away doesn't actually help. In fact, people were even more late because now there was no guilt and there was no financial uh, consequences. So the thing about, about money is that it actually changes dramatically our relationship to other people. We have this social relationship, and we have this financial relationship, and we have lots of relationship in between, like in the workplace. And what's interesting is that in those places in between, we have to think very carefully how much do we want the relationship to be about money, and how much do we want the relationship to be about the social norm and uh, social promise. Now let me take this one more step forward. 
We recently uh, did a large study with the chip manufacturer. This is a company that produced chips that uh, you might have in your computers. And the people who come to this uh, production facility to work come for four shifts a week. They come maybe on uh, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday. Think about something like this. So f they come four times a week. And the first, time, the first time that they come in the week, the company wants to get their performance to be high. And they think that if they get the first performance high, it would kind of help the, whole, the production of the whole week. So what do they do? They tell the employees, if you perform above this level, we'll give you $100 in a bonus. And they do it for the first shift, and there's no bonus for the second, third, and fourth. So the first thing we did was we measured how effective this, this was. But the second thing we did is we added other rewards. Uh, we said, what if we gave people pizza, actually delivered at home? So now it was not about money. It was about something that they would be heroes at home with their families and kids. And to another group, we said, what if instead of sending them pizza or money, we send them a text message from their boss saying, work well done? What would happen? Here is what happened. On the first shift, all three methods helped, and they all, all helped in the same way. So there was uh, giving a bonus help, sending pizza help, sending a text message helped, and all helped in the same way, which basically says that you should do the cheapest of the three. Um, if that's the case, uh, because all of them work in the same level. But here is the interesting thing. What happened on the second shift? The second shift, all of a sudden, money was not in question. What happened when they promised money on the first shift? The performance on the second shift actually backfired. It was less than the regular performance. On the third shift, it went up again. On the fourth shift, it got back to normal. What happened is that the moment you train people to work for money, they come on Monday, let's say, and you say, today, I want to do this, and here's the money, and go, go, go. I want you to get the money. I want you to get the money. You take the money away. People said, well, yesterday I worked for the money. What am I working for today? And all of a sudden, performance goes down, and then it goes back to the neutral level after, the fact, uh, after a while. What happens for the text message? Remember, text message is not about the financial reward. Text message in the social realm. I do something for you. You do something for me. What happened now? Performance on the first shift was the same. On the second shift, there was no decrease. There was no backfire. It went back to the standard level when you don't pay people, but it didn't go below. And in total, this chip manufacturer basically lost quite a few percentage of productivity by paying $100 and a bonus. But again, they didn't lose it on the shift that they were paying. They were losing it in other, in other shifts as well. Similarly, we just finished, or we're finishing a study on healthcare benefits, looking at small companies and whether they give their employees healthcare benefits or not. If you think about it, healthcare benefits is one of the ways an employer in which you say to the employee, I care about you. Um, I mean, you could, you could give people a hug from time to time and, you know, buy them a pen or uh, give them an iPad. But healthcare benefits are really about caring about your employees. You say, if something really bad happens, this is how we're going to take care of you. And here's the program that is going to make sure that when something bad happens, you're taken care of. Um, what we found is that the companies who held healthcare benefits, controlling for all kinds of things, actually do better in terms of employee employer relationship. And not only that, when we look at what happened in 2008, which is a huge challenge for different businesses, and we look at employee retention and loyalty and productivity, we see A, that productivity pays for the cost of healthcare. And the second thing is the 2008, which lots of people started moving and so on, actually protected against this move. And, and the, way, the way we think about it is that healthcare it's kind of like a handshake. It's kind of like the social contract that says, I care about you. Here's what I'm willing to do for you. Um, so we talked about the, the pain of paying. We talked a little bit about the social nature uh, of money. The last thing about money that I want to mention is the notion of relativity. Now, when we think about money, Money is all about opportunity cost, right? Money is all about opportunity cost. Every time you buy a cup of coffee, if you buy a cup of coffee now, you would not be able to do something in the future. 
you buy a computer now, you would not be able to do something in the future. And, and in reality, that's what we should do. The calculation should be, is this thing worthwhile more than all the other things I could do with my money now and in the future? The problem is that this is a very, very complex calculation. So what do people do when a calculation is too complex? Well, we do resort to something simpler. Something not as good, not as accurate, but at least something that we can do. And one of the things we do is relativity. Now, relativity is widely used in lots of areas of life. We make relative judgment in all kind of cases. But in money, it's particularly interesting. So imagine, for example, uh, that you're going to buy. This is an example I've given before. Imagine you go to a store to buy a pen. And you go to look at the pen, and it's $15. And you get out, you're going to the cashier. And the cashier said, you know what? You look like you're a person with a really nice smile. I have to tell you, there's a store four blocks down the street that is selling the same exact pen for $8 less. Instead of for 15 for 7 Now ask yourself whether you would walk four blocks to save $8. $8. Most people say yes. Imagine another case. You're going to buy an Armani suit. You come to check it out. Uh, and the salesperson said, you know what, you have a really nice smile. I have to tell you, there's another store three blocks down the street that is selling the same suit instead of for $1,015 for $1,007. Would you walk three blocks down to save $8 on the $1,015 suit? And most people say, no way. Now, of course, your bank account doesn't care where the $8 came from, from a pen or from a suit, but we do. If something looks like a big amount, a small change doesn't look that big. If something looks like a small amount, a change looks very large. Uh, here's another example. Imagine you're going to buy a car, and it's $30,000. And the salesperson says, for only $2,000 more, you can get leather seats. Now, I'm not sure what the benefits of leather seats are, but let's assume that they are. Think about whether you would spend only $2,000 more to get leather seats. Case number two, you're buying a chair for your office. Uh, it's a chair you sit, about, you sit on a lot, you use it a lot. It's $500, and the salesperson tells you that for $2,000 more, you could get leather seats. Now, this sounds crazy, right? But if you thought about the utility, the value of leather, whatever it is, hopefully you sit more in the office than you sit in the car. The value at home would be higher than the value in the car. But nevertheless, because we spend $30,000, it's easy to spend a bit more. When we spend $500, it's a real challenge to spend $2,000 more. Or oh, here's a final example. If you've ever uh, renovated your home, you must, you must be familiar with the following thing. Your contractor comes to you and tells you that for, five, for only $5,000 more, you could get Italian something or another. It could be granite, flooring, windows, whatever. It has to be Italian, and it's $5,000. Uh, I'm sure you've done decisions like that, and you can think to yourself, how quickly did you make this decision? Now, on the same day, you might be going to the supermarket and look at this shelf, and you might be comparing the prices of tomatoes. Now, your whole life comparing prices of tomatoes would not be equivalent to one quick decision about $5,000 for getting Italian granite or something. But nevertheless, when we spend lots of money, small amounts look uh, easy to spend. When we spend small amounts of money, it becomes harder. And this is the notion of relativity. It's the notion that we're judging things compared to other stuff. This is, by the way, the second reason why credit cards are so tempting. So we said in the clip that one of the things that credit cards do is they disassociate the time of consumption from the time of payment. Right? If you're at the store and you're signing something, you're not really paying. And when you pay, well, it really happened before. You're not consuming and paying at the same time. That's one of the things that credit cards do. The second thing that credit cards do is they basically create a situation in which you already pay so much, paying a little bit more is not such a, not such a big deal. And because of that, we make extra amount of, uh, of mistakes. Um, do we have any questions? Everybody, everybody is happy. So <laughs> uh, let me, what else uh, is curious about? Let, let me tell you about one other experiment that I'm hoping to get a partner uh, that would help us participate in this. So if you're interested, uh, let me know. So <clears throat> imagine, imagine a 401k plan in a business. Uh, what happens? Let's say the business uh, gives 10% matching. 
The way it works right now is the employee puts whatever they want, let's say 4%, and then the business puts 4% and everybody gets, uh, the person gets their match. And what, what happens here is that people leave money on the table, but people don't think and don't feel that they leave money on the table. So we did this as a game, so it's not a real experiment. I mean, there was real money, but it wasn't long-term with big employees. We did the same thing. People said, I want to match 4%. So in one condition, they did 4%. The work put 4%. The next month, the same thing happened, and so on. In the second condition, every month, the employer puts 10% in. The employee puts as much as they want, let's say 4%. And the employer takes the 6% back. Now, of course, mathematically, it's equivalent. But what happened? is that every month or every period of the game, we basically showed people that in this particular case, money was left on the table. And not only that, we're taking it away from you. What happened now? Very quickly, people increased their, their saving rates. So if you're interested in doing something like this in, uh, with your HR department, <coughs> let me know. Let me tell you one uh, final story. So we talked about social norms, and we talked about market norms. Uh, there was an interesting uh, story of a woman who basically wrote for advice. And she said that she was uh, very attractive and uh, wonderful in all kinds of ways. She lived in New York, and she basically wanted to date somebody who makes at least $500,000 a year. She said she's been quite successful in dating people up to 250, but she was not able to break the 250 barrier. And she wanted advice on how to how to get somebody with, with more money. And you know, this was, uh, oh, and, and she also said, by the way, she said that she's really beautiful. And she said, beautiful women marry richer men and so on. And she felt she was, she deserved to be in that, in that category, but she couldn't figure it out. Um, and people were outraged with her, with her question. Why? Because she took something like love and relationship and marriage and so on and made it just about the money. And you can actually imagine to yourself, you know, what, what would happen if you entered a relationship like this, which was basically a relationship of, you know, let's say, a sex for, for money. How, how would things look like? What would the dynamic of the relationship look like if you made the exchange so explicit? Now, there's no question that in some sense she was right. Uh, more beautiful women marry richer guys in, 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 in general. That's, that, that's correct. But the moment they make it just about this exchange, the financial exchange, it kind of ruins the whole fundamentals of the, of the relationship. But the nicest thing came from uh, one of the people who responded to her. And he said that he's a banker, and he said he makes more than $500,000 a year, so he's a good candidate, and he does find her attractive, so that works as well. But he said, look at the situation from my perspective, from the banker's perspective. He said, your assets, beauty, are likely to decrease over the, over the years, and my assets, money, is likely to increase over the years. And under those conditions, I think it's prudent to lease rather than to, rather than to buy. Um, and if you think about it, there's lots of things like this, that when we all of a sudden declare the financial fundamentals that happen underneath the relationship and thereby destroying it. So I hope you learn something about money. I hope you learn something about uh, relationship. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, next week, um, next month, Bill Balding and uh, Richard Stalin are going to be here. Uh, they are both uh, lively and interesting, and I'm sure it will be fun. So thanks a lot, and oh, and happy Valentine's Day. <laughs>